Hi guys, how's it? Welcome Trek Mall to my Afcon speaking followers. Welcome to everyone else, regardless of what language you're speaking. You speak at home. Uh, welcome back. I know we didn't do a post game video for uh, the final game of the season against Wales. I did an amazing how to get together out at the East Side Draft House here in Denton, Texas. Was able to get out about uh, twelve to sixteen people. Met a really lovely couple. Only been in the country about six weeks. Uh, from One was from Hotang and one was from the KZN. But uh, I have started a Facebook group uh, for North Texas Springbok followers. I will leave the link underneath the video if you guys want to join that. Anybody in North Texas that is a Springbok fan, join up. Man, we're going to do these get-togethers going forward. I think it's really fun to do. And uh, it was just a great time. Uh, so it was a good time to reflect. Obviously, a great year for the Springboks as we win a rugby championship. We won multiple titles. We go undefeated in the Autumn Internationals. And then we got the luxury of having the World Rugby Awards. Now, we, we already knew. We had announced. We had you know four potential candidates. Three of them were Springboks. We had Eben Etzebeth. We had Peter Steph the Toy. We had Cheslin Colby, uh, along with the Irishman, Kaylin Doris. We had Sasha Feinberg, nominated for Breakthrough Player of the Year. And uh, we were hoping to do well at the award show. And I mean, we did eventually do well at the end of the day. But from the very, very first announcement that they had, the very first category, we had Coach of the Year, and uh, I think we were all kind of eagerly anticipating, it's going to be Rassi, it's going to be Rassi. And then World Rugby does this. I had to Google who the guy was. I had no idea who this man was. Um it was the head coach of the French Sevens team that won Olympic gold uh, there in France. Um, and, I, and I think for a lot of us, a lot of us, it was kind of like, okay, uh, what? Okay. Uh, and then it, it, it didn't go bad or anything. I'm not sitting here saying, oh, it, it got worse. But I think for a lot of us, we were just kind of like, who? And, oh, well, he won a Olympic gold. Why didn't the Fijian coach ever get that? They won multiple ones. It just didn't make sense to me. And I think I, it gave me a bit of a sour attitude. And then we went into the next category, the newcomer of the year. And we got this. We got Wallace Satiti. Look, I will not deny that kid is amazing. He is the future of All Blacks rugby. I've made some comments. Hey, you know, good. They they passed Sam Kane. They sent Sam Kane on, and he's the he's the real deal. I I think that he is he's 22 years old and he is damn good. So I didn't I didn't take too much of offense to this. I was just like, cool, yeah, yeah, I agree. You know, he did great. I wish we'd gotten to see him a bit more in the rugby championship. I think we definitely will next year. Uh, now that Sam Kane has kind of moved out of the way and has uh, has hung up the boots, at least as far as his All Blacks career go. So at this point, I'm kind of like 50-50, kind of on the fence about everything. And then we get uh, to the men's player of the year. And I mean, I, I don't I don't think any of us could disagree with this. Now, I'd said, look, I think Oxen Shea should have gotten a nomination, and I think a lot of people did too. I wasn't the only one that said that. But we had Peter Steph Tatoy winning his second one, the last one he won in 2019. Did anybody check out his, his post-speech? Now, look, you guys know me. I'm not like the, the Bible-thumping type. I, I, I don't, but I don't have anything against it. I don't think there's anything wrong with being Christian. I don't have anything against it. And the fact that that's like the first thing he gives glory to is like, hey, look, my higher power. I got to give thanks to that. And then kind of talking about how, like, uh, I think the quote was, is, is if the whole, if, if we all eat, everyone eats, like it's, it, you put the team first. And I mean, obviously we could see the result on the pitch with him with that. He did. He put the team first and he deserved to be player of the year. Like no question. I still think Oxen Che kind of got robbed, but he didn't even get nominated. So we had to go with that. So at this point I'm like, okay, maybe world rugby is going to do the right thing. Then we go up to the next category, and I'm not doing these in order. I'm just kind of doing the ones that really, really meant something, at least to me. And we got the dream team for the year. Uh, Ox and Shea, obviously, no question. 
Uh, Malcolm Marks was a bit of a what? Like, not to say that he's bad, but he just didn't get a crap ton of playing time. I kind of probably would have put maybe gave Cody Taylor that. Uh, Tyrell, Tyrell Lomax, no question. Ebenezer Beth, no question. Todd Byrne, I think there could have been maybe an argument for like a Tupo Vi or maybe Scott Barrett. Not so much Scott Barrett. Uh, Pablo Matera, no question. One of the best flankers in the game. His opposite, Peter Steftatoy, we already know. Kalen Doris, also nominated for Player of the Year. Uh, absolutely great. Kind of helped them win that Six Nations. Uh, the real shocker for me, and it's later even made more even later, was Gibson Park at nine. Uh, we, we all know world rugby loves Antoine de Pos. Yeah, that's, I don't call him, he's Antoine de Pos. You're afraid to play outside of Europe. You're Antoine de Pos. You're not, I'm not going to call you by your fake last name. That's what you are. So I was really shocked that they picked Jameson Gibson Park at nine. I, I would pick him over Antoine. Antoine, whatever you want to say. De Puss. That's what I, I'd pick him over that any day of the week. I think he's way better. And then a little bit of a shock at 10 with uh, Damien McKenzie, who had some good games, had some bad games, um, but I couldn't really think of anybody else that I would really put in that. With the Springboks, we never consistently used a guy outside of Andre Pollard, but he didn't start. He'd come off the bench, that kind of thing. Uh, James Lowe, uh, the uh, Kiwi born Irishman. Um, Kind of a bit of a one-trick pony, but I get it. I get it. Uh, the opposite, Cheslin Colby, absolutely no question the best winger in the world right now. The center combination of the Milnerton grad, Damien Dialende, and the kid from the KZN, I don't think any of us could have debated that. I think some people tried to say Aki, but I didn't agree. Uh, I think that Hugh Jones cat does well, and I think uh, Tupelo too, not the Kiwi, but the Scottish Tupelo too. I think he's great too. And one that really kind of perplexed me because I don't see him as a dynamic 15. I think he's better at wing, and that's Will Jordan. So I wasn't like super disappointed by this list. I was a bit shocked, honestly, by not seeing a certain person on it. But of course, you know, they can't go an award show without it. You know, he, he really... He, he wasn't the reason they won that gold medal. He came off the bench a couple of, you know, all the games. He, he didn't reinvent the game. I honestly don't even think he's the best convert. Cheslin Colby, Quaka Smith is better at sevens than Antoine Dupont. I never got, you know what I mean? Like, I just kind of felt like it was them fanboying, like Francis Starboy. The head, yeah, we we get it, man. Like you've got to give him something because he doesn't win shit, really. Oh well, he wins Champions Cups and top fourteen titles, yeah. But on an international level, he wins nothing. He's a quarter finalist in the World Cup. He in the World Cup they host, they won a gold medal in the country. Had that had that Olympics been here, he probably wouldn't have even gone. He doesn't play outside of Europe. He's not going to do the All Blacks tour next summer. No, and that's why I call him Antoine de Pos, because he will not play outside of Europe. So there's really only one other category I really, really wanted to touch on in all of this, and it was because it was one of the categories that kind of hit home a little bit here for me. Uh, not that I you know, sit up here and uh, talk about this very much. But, hey, I've got to give a shout-out. Alona Marsh she finished second in Dancing with the Stars last night. I know that's not really rugby-related, but, like, look, we had Thanksgiving dinners, the Thanksgiving uh, holiday here in the U.S., and my mother-in-law, who does not watch rugby, brought her up. Now, we've been trying to make the game of rugby stick here in America, and the MLR ain't doing it. Notice I'm not doing really any content for casual bias on MLR because there's really just not much good to say about it at the moment. But Alona Marr is putting rugby in the mouth of people in America, of Americans. And that's why I'm glad she made the dream team. She's a great player, but she's more than anything, she's an ambassador for the sport at this point in America. When you've got Antoine de Post visiting the U.S. and he goes to an NFL team and he visits Messi, that's not helping rugby here. When you've got Luis Reese Zamet on the practice squad, hasn't made the team, he hasn't made the league, despite the way they word it, he's not helping rugby here at all. 
she's doing more for rugby than the supposed best player in the world right now. And she's not even playing. She's doing Dancing with the Stars and reality TV. She's putting rugby in mouths of Americans. They're mentioning, oh, do you know that rugby player, Alona Marr? She's bigger than Antoine de Pos on social media. Now, I'm not going to turn this into a women's rugby, women's sevens channel, but I am going to hype her up because good on you, sister. Good on you. You're doing more than the supposed best player in the world in America for the game. So at the end of the day, do I feel like Rassi got robbed? Fuck yeah, and I think everybody else knows it. World rugby is 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 turning into FIFA real quick. And that's what they want. That's why they're pushing the US to have a World Cup so badly because they want that FIFA money. They want that under under the table money. Antoine Dupuis was not the best men's sevens player this year. He wasn't even close. But they needed to have a name that they could say, hey, look, this guy's the best. The French sevens coach did not deserve to win coach of the year. Did Rassi Erasmus? Well, yes. You lose two games the entire year. You go undefeated on a Northern tour playing tier one high, you know, granted Wales is rubbish now. But at least we didn't play Japan. That's who France beat. They beat Japan. They got to play Japan. Now you can say, oh, they've beaten. Yeah, they beat us in 2015 and they beat Ireland in 2019. They're not what they are. Fiji would beat Japan right now. They have. They have beaten Japan this year. I think they've beaten them twice. So sitting up here and saying like, and I knew, I knew when France played Argentina, they were going to win that game because world rugby needs, oh, we can't just talk about the, the Springboks going undefeated on the tour. We've got to bring up another team. We've got to bring up France. So now they're the favorites going into the Six Nations. And I'm like, no, that's not going to happen. As much as I think we've seen a bit of a stumble from the Irish, I still think they're the best team in the Six Nations by far. I think we saw England look really bad. They finally got a win against Japan, of course. Scotland did okay. They were able to beat the Wallabies. The Wallabies, people thought they were back on top. No, I think that was a fluke. They were going to beat Wales no matter what, because they beat them twice during the summer. Beating England just showed you how bad England is. So I'm going to end this video. Uh, <laughs> Joe Marler plays his last game this weekend of rugby, and I, I just, I just want to make a comment about Joe Marler. You, you you did so much in your career. Did you ever win a World Cup? Of course you didn't. But for a guy that did so much in his career, you really ended it like a punk. You got you you saw the beef between Sexton and Iwani, and you wanted to feed into it, and you said the wrong thing. Then you went into your safe space, and then you tried to go back on it, and then you announced you were retiring. Did you what you say was it wrong? Yeah, I, I agree to an extent. You you wanted to go after the All Blacks and you went after something that has cultural significance for people. Well, I don't always necessarily agree. Like I'm a fan of the Hakka. I, I especially as a Springbok fan, you are excited when you see that because you know you're getting ready to play your biggest rival. Do I feel like they go through the motions with the Hakka sometimes and certain Hakka leaders don't really carry the Hakka properly? Of course. Not everybody is great at leading it. I thought TJ at one point was really great. I'm personally a fan of Pity Weepu. When he let it, that's when it really hit to me. But like letting somebody like Kieran Reed read it, lead it was terrible. It was a terrible idea. He just wasn't, he just wasn't that guy. But when Joe Marler went and said that and then went into a safe space and talked about, I'm going to get off of social media. Yeah, dude, like, dude, be a man. Like, if you really didn't mean it the way it came out, you should have immediately said, hey, look, look, this was misconstrued. I didn't mean it like that. Was what Johnny Sexton said that Rico Awani, was that any better? No, because I just think that's like a bitter guy trying to sell books. 
And I'm sure Joe Marler is going to do the same thing with this situation. He's going to act like he was the victim in all of this when it was like, dude, you did something stupid. Man up, stand on business. But since you didn't, you get to go out like a punk and nobody's going to miss you except English rugby fans because everybody else in the world is like good riddance, including this commentator. But we've got the URC back this weekend. We will still be doing the podcast on Sunday morning with my Oak Pierre in Boxburg. Come on out, man. Uh, 6 p.m. South African time in the evening, not in the <laughs> 6 p.m., not a.m., uh, come on out, come to the live, ask questions, chit chat with us. We talk rugby. Sometimes we get into other things, but 99% of the time it's rugby and mostly having to do with South African rugby, the spring box particularly, but we do talk about, uh, you know, a bit of club rugby and local grassroots rugby, that kind of thing. But uh, we're going to keep this going, folks. Uh, I don't know if I'll do a lot of URC coverage on here. I know we've got some good games this weekend and I'll pop in for that. And we'll do weekly videos still guys, but uh, I appreciate you guys. For all your support, you guys continue to support me, and I appreciate it every single day. So we'll talk again real soon, guys. Cheers.